Welcome you with Money 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 I'm Samira Abdi. Most often we're so focused on scrimping, scrapping, saving and investing that we forget that spending and spending wisely is as important as any saving or investment habit. What should you be spending on and which are the good spending habits that you need to nurture and how do you do that? Firoz Aziz of Anandrati Private Wealth Management joins in to answer all of these questions. Firoz, is there actually a list of what are the good spending habits? I mean, I can imagine things like say insurance or you know even healthcare uh, plans for that matter. But can the scope be broader than just that? I mean, what are the top four, five or six things that you'd put on your list? See, I'll say uh, anything which adds value to yourself is a very good spending habit. Okay, uh, by which I mean anything which actually enhances your mm -hmm. capability or your skill, and actually eats away some time where you would actually be doing spending wrongly. Now, for okay. example, if you are into reading, mm -hmm. if I actually have good books at home, mm -hmm. maybe I might skip a movie. And I'll mm. save something. Mm. So something which keeps you occupied for longer are good spending mm. habits to my mind where okay. you don't need uh, recreation. So to get specific, I would say uh, something uh, like a uh, uh, something like a yoga instructor mm. coming to your place could mm. be a good uh, spending habit. Uh, your health care could be mm. a, spend, a good spending habit. Uh, if you look at spending habits from a from a financial perspective, uh, spending on, on, on health insurance could mm. be a very, very good uh, spending habit. There are several, uh, but yeah, you know, broader spectrum, the concept is that anything which occupies time is a good spending habit. Mm. Anything which adds value to yourself is a good spending habit to my mind. Okay, so in that case, would some thing like say a retirement be considered a good spending or would you rather put it in the basket of investments? I would actually categorize it as investments because you're investing for your future. So it would not be completely a spending, it would be setting aside some money for your invest uh, on, on your retirement which would be an investment but importantly hmm. that is the only goal in one's life which is a certainty. Hmm. Right, because getting your child married, hmm. m m the child might be capable enough to accumulate enough money to get himself or herself married. But retirement is something which hmm. you have to take care of yourself. Hmm. So if you categorize that spending or investment, hmm. it is equally important irrespective of the bucket you categorize it in into. Okay, so you mentioned calling a yoga instructor home, right? So I, you know, all of these, like say a gym membership, an extracurricular hobby that you might want to pick up, all of these I suppose would uh, come under the same uh, header, right? Uh, but should these really be categorized as good spending habits? I mean, isn't this just something um, uh, else that you spend on over and above your spending or investment or saving? No, I would categorize them as good spending habits. Mm -hmm. Why? Because uh, it helps you actually be energetic enough the entire day maybe mm. right and your productivity shoots up now for example i i have started uh, a spending habit which looks a little uh, extraordinary in terms of expense but i call a person who would actually a masseuse home mm. right every week so i have a good night's sleep the next day and that's uh, that improves my uh, body circulation whatever health habits it has uh, health benefit it has but that's an expensive affair but i think it's adding value to me mm. uh, because i'm energetic and my productivity for the subsequent one couple of days at least uh, is significantly higher and I'm looking forward to it over the weekend anyway. So. Okay, so basically these are feel-good factors, right? That you're saying it's okay to spend on uh, stuff like this. But taking this logic forward, uh, you know, like I would say, for example, that remodeling my home is something that's feel-good for me. I mean, where would, uh, how far can one stretch this list? See, uh, very importantly, uh, of course, see the purpose of money is to buy yourself some happiness okay of course there are some things which can't be bought with money but there's a lot of happiness which money can bring so you have to as an individual list down what are my uh, items which actually make me feel happy and 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 see whether it's an, if as long as your investments are not being compromised then spending is wise. Hmm. If you're actually going to be uh, compromising on investments to actually feel good. Now, for example, you say that I have to do my redo my house. Now, that might actually hamper your contingency fund maybe. Then, then it's a sure no, no go or no hmm. non-starter at all. Okay, so you know by that same logic this list is actually quite endless. Uh, there's a regular servicing of your car for example. Now whether or not it comes into your contingency, eats into it, it is something that you need to spend on how much ever it may cost. By that logic even taking an annual vacation for that matter, you know even, I mean would you say it's a priority even if it's eating a little bit into your contingency? 
No, I, I would say that uh, um, actually, if it if it actually eats into your mm -hmm. kitty of the rainy day, then you're better yeah. off living without it. So spendings have to be must have, mm -hmm. uh, and the other are good to have. Mm -hmm. The good to have expenses can actually be compromised, but the must have can't be, mm -hmm. right? So I think redoing your house is a good to have uh, mm -hmm. goal uh, or an expense, not not a must have, because you already have a specific kind of a modeled house. We don't have to remodel it unless. Uh, you are actually not dipping into your contingency fund and that's a sure no no you know a lot of people actually put waiting for uh, the sale season to begin under the good spending habit right but it's something that has never appealed to me because for the simple logic that you end up buying things just because they're cheaper you may may not need it the stuff that you've actually waited for uh, you know the need may not be there anymore by the time the sales arrive or you may just end up buying something that you're not satisfied with is this something that you would categorize as a good spending habit is actually waiting for the discount season Actually, or even no. going to a thrift store for that matter. Correct. I, I think uh, you're absolutely right. There are surveys done saying that the the things which you buy over or during sales are hardly used. Mm. So you're absolutely right. When you're actually not buying it at discount, you're buying only something which is necessary. Mm. Actually, sale is a marketing gimmick to actually take more stuff off the shelf and into homes. Yeah. So I think you should not fall for that trap. You would be buying two shirts instead of one and you might end up not using the other one and, and uh, that'll, that'll that will gather matter. dust. So limited mainly to say the purchase of white goods then? Correct. Yeah, okay. for sales where, where there is white goods, you can't have two air conditions uh, yeah. for a room which is 100 <laughs> square meter. So, so I think I think you're absolutely right. That's a big myth which uh, everybody falls prey to during mm -hmm. sale. I would actually get more value, but you would get lesser value because you're bringing stuff which is not valuable for you. Yeah, and this is something that you learn only with age, I guess. <laughs> All right, so let's take a break on that note. And up next, we'll actually tell you how your spending habits should be changing as you grow older. Stay tuned to Money, Money, Money. Welcome back here with Money, Money, Money. We're discussing the best spending habits to cultivate and nurture. And our expert this week is Firoz Aziz of Anandrati Private Wealth Management. So Firoz, we've spoken a little bit uh, about, you know, the kind of things that you should be spending money on but is this something that actually changes with age I mean when you're 20 should your priority list be very different from when you're 30 should things be phased out as you move into your 40s does it actually happen that way correct it actually happens that way and then spending patterns dramatically change with age uh, people who are younger maybe mm -hmm. spend more on technology and people who are older they spend more on experiences like mm. dining fine mm. dining okay and and, and when you're young you certainly you, you live on a wrap off for example yeah. uh, but you would still not compromise on your electronic gadget which you wish to buy spending patterns have a dramatic change uh, as age progresses and it should and the natural progression of spending habits should ideally change I think I think older people uh, should be more more wiser when they're spending and they automatically become that because you're spending the money which they earned because mm. there's a correlation between time taken to earn it and mm. spend it. If you're spending your one day salary on something which is one, one meal, it'll, it'll be very difficult to do that unless uh, you were earning that one day. Yeah. You're spending one day to earn uh, a meal. That doesn't seem wise. If it's your dad's money, then the behavior is dramatically Yeah, that, that's just simpler. It's just really simple. Yeah. I can imagine that. But tell me one thing. You mentioned the experience of, say, dining out. Uh, so should people actually be spending on experiences and not just objects? See, uh, whenever it comes to experiences, mm. now I, I would say that if you're spending on objects, of course both are important. Mm. Uh, experiences should be spent on when you have company, when you are actually creating an expense uh, experience with a few people. Mm. I would not want to spend on experience when I'm just dining alone maybe. Mm. Right, so experiences have to have a lot of other people so that the experiences stay in the memory for long, longer mm. periods of time. You would not remember a, 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 a soul trip taken abroad, but if you if you had ten people along, and that's an experience which I would love to spend. Yeah, on, but right? soul trips are becoming all the rage now, Feroz. Correct. Yes, of course it's becoming a rage because people don't want to be invest bound. in yourself, invest in your own, own. experience. 
but I, I would say uh, experience uh, is better spent on when you have other people sharing the experience uh, okay. the longevity of that in your mind is what yeah. you've spent it for and that's longer psychologically than than actually going alone and spending that time Okay, so whatever works for whoever, right? Yeah, absolutely. But, um, you know, just a disclaimer, I mean, it almost seems like we're giving a blanket approval for anything that feels good or anything that, you know, you'd like to experience and you haven't done it so far. But that's not the case, is it? I mean, it doesn't mean that you go out and uh, uh, go actually over your budget. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you, you can't have a blanket approval to actually spend on things which make you feel good because if that's the case then you end up spending everything which you earn and potentially earn as well mm -hmm. with, with a credit card maybe become, becoming so easy yeah. for somebody to get. So you should only spend on things after you have acquired yourself the need to have goals, mm -hmm. the need to have uh, objectives are fulfilled in the form of investments is when you have been liberalized yeah. to actually come into that category. So you have to check whether you have moved on from need to have uh, to good to have goals. If you are an individual actually moved on to the second category, then you yeah. can actually not be uh, too tight fisted and and be more uh, expense friendly than you yeah, should. Which is why retirement holidays are so big. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, so no revolving credit for anything that you think is just a good to have experience unless it's an emergency, right? Absolutely. Uh, revolving credit uh, for something which you which is not a necessity, hardcore necessity day-to-day -day life is actually a recipe for disaster, financial disaster. But uh, right. Firoz, where does one actually draw the line between good spending habits and impulsive buys? You know, something may make me feel good and I may really think that it's really important for me and purchase it on an impulse. I mean, where does this stop? See, so how does somebody evaluate? Because everybody's your behavior is very different. So all you have to do is you have to just introspect with your previous spendings. That's mm -hmm. a very good way of throwing light to your spending pattern itself. Mm -hmm. If you actually list down any item which you've spent more than an X amount, like 10,000 rupees, and then see the last 10 items I spent 10,000 rupees on, how much, how much of it do I use today? And if the answer comes, only two of them, then it's clear that you're an impulsive buyer and you need to be uh, never actually indulging yourself. So and cheaply. in the same vein, I suppose also pruning your expenses on things that you don't need, like a gym membership may be important, but if you haven't used it for two months, Absolutely. then cut it out and that will become your good spending habit as well. Absolutely. I think the net net point I'm trying to make is introspecting on your previous spending, which people yeah. don't do. Okay, categorizing a wardrobe saying that what haven't you used for so long? Yeah. And then that will tell you that you're actually uh, spending more than you should, maybe. So. All right. So there are things that you must need. There are things that you must have, and there are things that you can do without. You just have to know which, which to one? put in what basket. Firoz, thanks very much thank for joining so in. Appreciate your time, and thanks thank very much, so much for advising our viewers. Thank you. So All right. On that note, we'll take a very, very quick break. Still ahead is our tip of the week. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back, you're with Money, Money, Money and here is our tip of the week. Wealth is not earned, it has to be created. Therefore, it's not enough that you invest whatever is surplus. The first financial resolution of 2016 should be to carve out the investable corpus from your monthly inflow after budgeting for basic expenses and before accounting for luxury spends. In terms of resolutions, uh, our suggestions uh, would be one, keep a resolution to save more and keep a target, uh, 10,000 rupees, 20,000 rupees per month. Keep a specific target that I'm going to save more uh, this year, uh, month on month. Okay, so you've set aside money, but how do you put it to good use? Simple data points like uh, SIP of rupees 1,000 every year in one of the best performing diversified equity mutual funds would have given you a CAGR of 21%. That's an annual compounded return of 21%. So you do not need to do something that is complex, something you do not understand, something that is locked in. Just plainly keep it simple. For me, that's a very crucial point of making investment decisions for the new year. Would you rather take 10,000 rupees every day for 30 days or a rupee which doubled in value every day for the same period. If you pick 10,000 rupees every day, you've made a very poor choice indeed. Because this means 
that you have only 3 lakhs at the end of the month. Had you picked a penny which doubled in value every day for the same period, you would have been sitting on a pile that read almost 50 lakhs. The process that needs to be followed is that you define your goals, assign a time horizon and assign a target. This really helps you in terms of deciding which asset class you should invest in. Now, for example, when you're investing for the short term, your focus should be on safety of capital. So you go into debt products. When you're investing for the long term, then your focus should be to beat inflation. So you invest in equity. And so you must establish all your goals. So all those investors who have not been following this approach, you know, my advice would be they should try and align all their investment to their goals. And also important thing is to create a separate portfolio for each of the goals. And why it is important is because many a times we have seen investor, you know, creating one portfolio and as and when they require money, you know, they keep taking out and they realize after some time that they don't have enough money for their own retirement or they don't have money for some other goal. So it's important to follow a goal based approach and also make sure that there is a separate portfolio for each of the goals. And in return for your patience, it's only natural to expect that you get some generous returns. So what is it that keeps going wrong? Most investors focus on gross return when they analyze their investment. You know, you must have heard people talking about, okay, I'm going to get 8% return or 10% return. What they do not realize is that gross return is only one aspect. You have to pay tax on that. And there is also inflation, which you have to take care of. So many a times what we see is the net return that they get or the net real rate of return that they get is actually negative. So I think it's, it's important for investors to realize that they need to create a portfolio in a manner that especially when they're investing for the long term, that they actually earn positive real rate of return. Otherwise, imagine what will happen is even if you're investing for 20, 25 years, there will be a situation where you will realize that your money has just grown in numbers and not in value. And don't forget your loans. Pay down your debts, especially the high cost debt like credit card debt, like personal loans, pay down those debts. And how do you know when you have enough money? Every year when you begin, measure up your assets, measure up your liabilities, know what your net worth is. It will go a long way in helping you plan your savings, plan your investments and going for those milestones. As you build the financial plan, what are your milestones, what are the lifetime events that you need to fund for, what are the saving habits that you need to change, what are the spending habits you need to change. So it's always, always a great strategy to calculate your net worth build a financial plan and find ways and means to achieve this. Every investor must ensure that they have taken the right insurance product and they have separated the insurance from investment. So they should not be really focusing on uh, traditional plans. It's very common to see investors having 20, 30 and even 40 uh, you know, insurance plans. I think they need to understand that it's not about having the number of insurance plan, but it's also the quantum of insurance plan. So the first aspect has to be life insurance. The second is health insurance. Now, again, here again, the quantum has to be right and the type of policy that you take has to be right. So if it is a young family or a small family, they should go for a you know, floater health plan. But if there are senior citizen in the family, then they should go for individual plans for them. And remember, just planning your investments right is not the end of the road. Once you've got the portfolio strategy right, your investment strategy right, your financial plan right, consult someone who's a financial doctor, who's an advisor to you, who can give you step-by-step -step approach in building a model portfolio, an investment portfolio. Review this versus your objectives every month. See how your asset allocation is, see how your concentration is, how your liquidity position is, and does it match up to what you started with in the first place. If not, go back. And finally, do not get sentimental about your investments. Investments are supposed to generate returns given a measure of risk. If they don't add up, you need to exit. Cut your losses. Do not get married to your investments. Research has shown that financial New Year resolutions tend to be followed much more uh, committedly then uh, the normal uh, New Year resolutions like what all of us have uh, in the sense of losing weight, spending more time with family, etc. Financial resolutions somehow we tend to uh, go and deliver on much more uh, in, a, in a much more committed manner. 
Viewers, remember, keep pointing to us at money, money, money at network18online.com. You can also find us on Twitter. Write to CNBC TV 18 News. Use the hashtag money. And remember that you can also log on to YouTube to catch this as well as all our previous episodes. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week.